this week on the Back Table Podcast. The mentor-mentee relationship is about somebody looking for some guidance, looking for help, asking for that, and then embarking on a process of, of working together to figure out what that person needs and wants. And what we're trying to do, what you and I are trying to drill down into is what's the essential component of what a mentor and a mentee should look for. And I think we can be very specific. You're looking for a relationship where you're looking for a flat structure. You're looking for shared or common interests. Those are the three things. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and backtable.com. Hey, everybody, really exciting news. Our listeners asked and we have answered. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Backtable and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on episode pages at backtable.com, or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend on a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Again, guys, this helps support the show and allows us to keep bringing you great content. Before we dive into our topic today, just want to say a quick word from our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad radiation protection products, developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See RadPad.com for more information and contact info at RadPad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. This is Eric Keller as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce my special guest, Dr. Bob Vogelzang from Northwestern University, very well known in the IR community, past SIR president, did a lot with the AMA as well for our specialty, could just go on and on, but that's not what we're here for. It's more to talk about mentorship today. How are you doing, Bob? Good, Eric. Uh, we are talking about mentorship today. We uh, should be an interesting talk. I've spent my career, I guess, doing it. I never called it that, but I'm, we're here to talk and you and I have a relationship. So exactly. So I think our, our game plan for today is we're going to start by just trying to talk about what mentorship is in the first place, kind of what makes a good mentor mentee. And then finally, how does one find one? How does one find a good mentor mentee relationship? What can be done to create that sort of environment? So maybe we can just start with, you know, mentorships everywhere. It's like a buzzword now. And is it definable? What does it mean to you? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. How about that? I mean, it's uh, motherhood and apple pie. You, you, everybody's a mentor. Uh, I just, uh, I'm amazed. Everyone's and doing it. Everybody's doing it. And to my view, most people have a sense of what it is, but it, we can't find a definition that I feel comfortable with aside from a relationship between two people. But yes, it's everywhere. Well, I mean, you know, why, why trust our own experience when we have, we have Google, right? Maybe we can just, uh, throw it out there to the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know what the old phrase is, uh, the smartest person in the room is now the room. So let's ask the room. How, how many answers do you get when you look up mentorship on, on Google? I mean, how many hits do you get? I get a ton. I mean, yeah. great mentorship. Yeah. There's mentorship cycle. I mean, it goes on and on and on and, and page after page, after page, after page, after page. Millions. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that say about mentorship? It says to me that everybody's doing it and it's a hot topic, which is true. But it also suggests to me that people are using their own specific definitions of mentorship and what it means. I mean, I just looked up mentorship here and the guidance provided by a mentor. Is it definable, Eric? Do you think you have a definition of mentorship? I don't know so much of a single definition. Maybe it just speaks to that there's a myth that there's one best mentor-mentee relationship out there, and it's more of just the relationship itself of which it can take many different productive forms in a way. I don't know if you need eight steps to mentorship, but maybe it's just the diversity. Well, I think you're right. I think you've just hit, it, hit on it, which is essentially it's a relationship. And, you know, as much as you try to teach it or try to model it, ultimately it's between two people. 
And, you know, you can be as successfully or unsuccessfully married as you wish, but reading books may help, but it probably won't, right? It's between two people and the unique nature of those two people and their relationship. So that's true. Exactly. Do you think that people understand that mentoring is that way? In other words, do people really get what mentoring is? I have a sense that they don't. They use the word, but the word doesn't mean anything except that they're doing that activity that they think they are doing. Right. It's almost like we say something so often that it loses its meaning, like a patient centered right. care or aligning incentives. Like it, it's not who's going to argue with it, right? Like you said, motherhood and apple pie, but, but at some point it loses its meaning almost. Well, I, I think we can delve into it a little bit by doing what the great Ken Burns once said, uh, I was at a lecture with him and he said, facts don't convince people, stories convince people. So. I think our story is a good way to illustrate mentorship, at least as you and I experience it. So let's talk about that. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, I didn't tell my side of it, actually. Uh, so I was at medical school at Northwestern, where you are, and I wanted to do, I wanted to study turf wars and ask around. People talked about interventional radiology, and then it came up about uterine fibroids. Maybe, you know, that would be a, a juicy topic to dive into. And so they said, oh, well, you got to talk to Bob Vogelsling and Howard Crispin. So, yeah, you know, I reached out, came to your office. It's usually Tuesday mornings. And we start, just started chatting, uh, not only about that project, but then other things. And it just, it just kind of fostered from there. That's right. But we somehow established a relationship that was based on common interest and curiosity and an openness. Well, from my perspective, I've done this a bunch. Uh, I've had young people in. It's one of the things that keeps me in medicine, actually, in academic medicine. I started years ago when I said, uh, well, you know, I'll do this for a little bit and then I'll go into private practice and, and do cases. And then I understood fairly rapidly that the day-to-day -day interactions with young people and what it took to teach people and be with young academic physicians or young residents was something I enjoyed a great deal. And out of that naturally or organically flowed. So you somehow got my name, but who, who, what made you decide to get some help or to look for some direction? Cause that's obviously part of the quest as well. I mean, I guess, you know, selfishly, I wanted to, I wanted to explore that interest, but then the question is, you know, why I talked to lots of different people. It's like, why, why keep having that conversation? And, you know, for me with you, it was that it's more of like an intellectual honesty and humility that I found refreshing that you seemed very, uh, sincere. And when we interacted, we had those common interests, as you were saying, it seemed like that we kind of operated on the same wavelength and the way that we, we talked about things. Like I had, I remember the first time that we tried to do a uh, grounded theory, this anthropologic method, and this anthropologist came to your office, the three of us sat there and we were going to start analyzing some stuff. Two hours later, we'd gotten like, halfway through one transcript <laughs> and we both kept giving each other we both kept giving each other looks and then you know that person left and i think you were like eric i can't do this and i was like yeah we gotta we gotta find a different way like this isn't the way to do it <laughs> yeah that's a good story and it's exactly correct so i think that we illustrate seeking out somebody who you share interests with and can explore together so you know that's the thing you can't teach. How is that sense of exploration or sense of a relationship with another person teachable? I, I think it's hard because ultimately you can direct somebody to do something. See, mentoring is not about me directing you to do something, right? I can give you a project that might be useful. You might learn some things in our interaction. We'll, we may learn back and forth. You may learn from me. I learn from you. But it's really more than that. It's really a conversation. So I think that's what mentoring at its core is, a personal relationship. And, and how would you suggest to somebody find that? I don't know. But certainly it's, it's that more than anything else. It's not a student-teacher relationship. It's really a collegial relationship. Mentors really are in the same field, right? Mm -hmm. And the only difference between me and you is the fact that I've been at it longer, period. Yeah. So you're a colleague, different level. The only difference is time. 
Yeah. So it sounds like that, you know, you were saying that maybe the common definition of mentorship is that relationship, not so much of a power differential as much as colleagues. And then I guess the question is, does it take on different forms at different stages of the career? Or is that kind of the underlying theme throughout? I would believe it is, but it's dependent again on the, uh, the relationship first and foremost, and the desire to learn, right? Explore. To me, the mentor, 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 mentee relationship is about a, a joint exploration. That's how I've always approached it. I just can't say that enough. I, I think most of the mentor in mentoring institutions, the things I read are poorly defined as a hierarchical structure and really you want a flat structure. Yeah. yeah. The only difference being between you're on the same, same flats, flat plane, except one is further along in terms of the X axis that is time. Yeah. I do have to say that, I mean, at least in my experiences, that's been a common uniting theme, even though, you know, I had a different relationship with like a Jeremy mm -hmm. Collins that was there at Northwestern. Our relationship was very different than my year relationship, but a common theme was that, that I didn't feel like there was this big power differential or whatnot yeah. that I could go and drink whiskey with Jeremy Collins at a drum bar in Chicago or stuff like that. And that that wasn't weird. Yeah. Essentially, I think we've defined it as how we see it. And I think it's the formula for a successful mentor mentee relationship, right? I think it's quite clear. I'd be curious to know what you have experienced as you search for a mentor, because ultimately it's the mentee search. There's some more of the mentor, the senior person looking for a, a young people to guide, but it's really the search. In my experience, it's almost always been the search. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely had bad interactions uh, with people, definitely have not hit it out of the park. And I think that the only way that I found good relationships why, was by keep putting myself out there, you know, almost it's, it's like dating to an extent that I definitely went on a first date with someone and either because one, they just like weren't responsive and didn't seem very supportive for whatever reason. Maybe we just have different interests or they're too busy with other things or other stuff like that. Like those, those are the kind of red flags to me. Not that the person's a bad person. It's just wasn't a good match or that we, um, what you went on the, the Tinder for mentors. App. Yeah. But you know, I was, <laughs> was <laughs> I was swiping a lot in medical school is what I'm trying to say, yeah, yeah. you know, every specialty nine day, middle of the night whatever, you know, whoever would, whoever would have a conversation with me. But I guess to me, what it, it taught me was that need for some sort of inherent search or curiosity and to not let the fact that that first date that you go on is a bad one, that that means like, oh, something must inherently be wrong with me rather than just maybe just haven't found the right mentor or whatnot. Uh, I definitely have had people in, in IR too, that just like, we weren't, we didn't jam. So, well, not everyone wants to do grounded theory and psychoanalyze everyone. Well, so. there you have it right. There is another part. The mat, the interests have to match. If, if you're not interested in CT scanning of the pancreas and you want to do vascular intervention, don't go to the CT guy. Right. But that's another basic idea. Match your interests with those of the mentor. I think a bad match, I had one early on where I wasn't really interested in the project or the details and I went along with it and I hated it, but we weren't sharing a common interest. So you would say common interests, relationships that click in terms of however that personal aspect goes and non-hierarchical structure of the relationship are the three critical elements of a successful venture. I think so. I remember one person that I, it was when I was looking for residencies, of course, what like say the, the program, but it was in an interview trying to establish like these new mentor relationships at a place I was going to go to. And they asked me what, and they were like, oh, I've seen you done a lot of research. Like, what's your favorite thing you've done? I was like, well, I, you know, I, I think the studying physicians and their cultures, cause it is very unique. It's a hundred, was a hundred percent me and stuff. They're like, oh, I've, of the real research that you, you've done. What's your favorite <laughs> Yeah. Well, there you have it. Very clear, right? It's just, we're not the right match. Not the right match. That's exactly right. No, a hundred percent true. Well, did you have any problems in terms of starting a process with someone and then having to back off? And do you have any advice as to how that would take place or what you did? 
Well, I feel like I need more advice from you because as I've, um, with this applied ethics thing that I've been doing, you know, I've been more in a mentor relationship more than a mentee relationship sometimes. Ah. And that's been a difficult transition for me, uh, just trying to figure out to deal one with the different people's follow through or whatnot. Like, how do you deal with the person that's kind of flakier or doesn't really follow through? How do you say, how do you like break up with a mentor or mentee mm -hmm. in a tactful way? Or how, how much of it is you versus them? Like, do you need to mold yourself to be a better mentor? And you're just like, I'm not doing a good enough job. And that's why this isn't working out versus that maybe again, like we've been talking about, it's just not the right match. That's been like a more recent struggle for me that I wonder you've done this a lot longer than I have. Yeah, I would say that the first and foremost thing is have a project that you want to see through to the end. Too often, some of the projects associated with it, and they always are associated with this relationship, are too complex and that individual doesn't understand them. So get it to a point where the mentee, the person you're working with, has a doable project. That, that was always what I did, and it satisfied the need for that person to complete something. And, and often there was a goal, a very pragmatic goal, which is let's get a paper out of this thing so you have a paper to be have on your CV. So I was always very practical about it. So that's the other element of it. Don't make it too complex. I've seen so many people get tied down in endless data grinding, and you may have people who want to do that, but for a young person who's just starting out, give them something simple. I, I'll give you some examples, Eric. I think I've done that in every one of the people I've, I've had any sort of serious mentor-mentee relationship. For example, one, a person who you know, who's the chairman of a major academic department, he wrote his first paper with me. What was it about? It was a case report. Yeah. I just understood that he would get far more satisfaction out of seeing the completed work and not be part of a whole. Mm. And I've held that throughout. I, I could point to many, many people. I tend to do that. So I think that's a, that's a good idea as a mentor. Keep it simple. Yeah. Keep it straightforward. Keep it doable. What's the deliverable? Kind of builds momentum in a way. Yep. You know, that you, it's like you can take a little bite of something and that keeps oh, yeah. you going to maybe something larger in the future. That's right. Our relationship was unique to me in that I was learning from you because you were, you were evaluating and, and learning this grounded theory about ethics. I had always had a, an interest in ethics, as you know, that's why we got together. So it was mutually beneficial to, to me. I would say that I have been far more benefited from mentoring a lot of young people than they have benefited from me. I really believe that because I've stayed curious and I have to answer stuff. I have to figure out a project and so on. It keeps me mentally nimble. So the benefit is all on my side, in my view. And, you know, you'd have to ask other people who have, I've had relationships with how they feel, but that's how I see it. So I was going to say, I wonder what, what they think, because definitely it feels the opposite to me, but I mean, maybe that's the product of a good relationship is that each person is in their view, benefiting more than the other person. That's what keeps them going to a degree. Yeah. Wouldn't you say that? I would say that's true of all human relationships and good ones are mutually concerned about the other person. They're symmetric. They're not asymmetric. Asymmetric relationships have a certain role but symmetric relationships last and they're the most beneficial to both parties. You know, the spirit of receiving and the spirit of giving, the two are inter are uh, connected. So that's for sure. I mean, I would say that my experience is reflective of that. And I would advise that anybody else who's being a mentor, just use those basic ideas. Yeah. What about environments? Is there like an environment that creates more of these relationships, you know, is there the right Tinder for, for mentee hookups or is this more of a product of the, the individuals themselves, you know? No, I think it's an activity which can be part of the water. I'll give you a, a good example that I know from several of uh, people I know who are either at MIT or have been there. MIT flattens the terrain, just like I said, it's not hierarchical. And as an example of that, a shining example of that, all 100 level courses are taught by senior tenured professors. Wow. And as Richard Feynman said so eloquently, 
if you really want to know that you've mastered a subject, teach a 100 level course in it, right? So you know this, Eric, when you have to teach something and you have to get it to the non-jargonized, understandable form, it forces you to be at your best. And so at MIT, professors are in front of the class. They're not TAs, they're not lower level people, they're teaching the 100 level classes. And what that means is that that's the person you're interacting with on a regular basis, office hours and the like, and you get the benefits of that because relationships spring from that regular interaction. Yeah. And there are others, for example, I'll give you Northwestern. I mean, there are people who are mentoring at Northwestern, undoubtedly. But sure. we, with great fanfare, brought in somebody who was a mentoring dean, the dean of mentoring. I thought, holy the cow, guru. That's, that's great. Yeah, Master of the Six Sigma of mentoring. <laughs> the Six Sigma. Uh, probably well, a black belt, at least. Black belt? Yeah, absolutely. So his task was to set up at every level in every department a mentoring program. I participated it really hasn't gone anywhere because they were mandating mentoring. Mm. It's like, okay, Eric, it's your turn. You have to pick a mentor or Bob, you have to pick a mentee. Let's match you. Not how it works. Now I'm not all touchy feely. And what we need to go do is go out to dinner and figure out if we like one another, but that sort of structured format did not work at Northwestern. Yep. I actually had a very similar interaction recently, actually with a, I, I called it more of like a, a prearranged marriage mentorship where the idea was like, well, you know, oh. similar, like it's time to, you know, choose a mentor or we're going to, we're going to choose it for you. We're going to pair mm -hmm. you up with someone that we think would be a, a good person for you. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't talked to that many other people that went through this process necessarily, but I don't know of any of them that are still meeting with that person, myself included. Correct. It's just not the, I, I don't think it's the way to do it. <laughs> Wrong approach. Uh, maybe some mentorship institutions might help us. How that's, many are we're there? not part of a men mentorship institution. <laughs> that's that's our problem. <laughs> now, I, I did take the opportunity to look up Institute Mentoring Institute. Stunning, like literally stunning. Every profession, every company has a mentorship institute or institution of mentorship. Maybe they know how to do it, but I, I would imagine that's mandated again. I think you have to look at the results and there are people who are successful mentors and there are people who are not successful mentors and programs that mentor people and, and graduate a lot of young people who end up in academics. You know, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done at Northwestern and it's worked for us. I don't have a secret sauce, but you know, from my program, we've managed to put a lot of people in a lot of different positions in academic medicine. Yeah, I think uh, three academic chairmen, a bunch of IR program directors, and so on and so forth, uh, chiefs of IR. And I think it's because of that. I think it's because we've practiced what we preach. Hmm. You know, in other words, personal interactions, relationships, curiosity, and the rest springs naturally from there. I can see that. I mean, what's the opposite of intelligence? Uh, lack thereof. No, it's not stupidity. In my view, it's incuriosity. Mm. The stupid person is incurious. And so curiosity should drive it, right? Should be energized by and activated by that process of, hey, this is cool stuff. What can we learn? Let's try this. This is a cool project. So that's, that for me is the, is the essence of it. I did feel like that at um, Northwestern IR has a very good culture for mentorship. And, you know, though I think that you, you know, say you don't have that secret sauce, may, maybe that that's part of it to a degree is that there is a lot of curiosity and that curiosity is met with openness that then fosters more curiosity that I, I felt even as a, as a medical student, right, that I could just walk into the IR department there and run into any of those people and have a conversation with them as, as a colleague or throw an idea past them or ask them a question. Mm -hmm. It always felt very encouraged. And I think that's what made me feel, you know, to this day that I still have a lot of connections with those people, even though I did resident, I'm doing residency elsewhere. So I think that speaks to the power of that environment. Yeah. And, and what we're trying to do, what you and I are trying to drill down into is what's the essential component of 
what a mentor and a mentee should look for. And I think we can be very specific. You're looking for a relationship where you're looking for a flat structure. You're looking for shared or common interests. Those are the three things, you know, it's been said that we are at our best when we take not advantage of the knowledge of others. And so that's a, to me, that's a mutually beneficial thing. You know, we're handing the baton We're you know, it's a relay race, right? That's how this is supposed to work. At least that's how human beings interact. That's how societies flourish. That's how advancements are made. Yeah. The baton gets passed. So this is really nothing more than that, right? Then is the flip side of that coin is how you find or become one, which are all those same things to a degree of kind of like the, the closed mouths don't get fed, that as a mentee, you kind of have to be curious and put yourself out there um, in order to, to have that sort of relationship. That's right. And it's hard, it's simple, but I can't define it. Neither can you. That's what we found out about Google. Google, even the definition we found was circular, which is nuts, right? It's being mentored. And so I think that we can state with confidence that those who are successful in finding a mentor and in mentoring mentees, perhaps finding mentees, are those who look for those attributes. That's it. Right? Nicely put. I agree. Do you have other... Pearls of wisdom. Pearls. Yeah, right. A lot of pearls. I, I wouldn't call them pearls, but I would say that it builds on the work that we've done, hmm. which is your work that you kind of advanced and you and I kind of bounced off each other and ended up in this medical tribalism thing that we kind of played with and have continued to play with is how would you advise a young person who hasn't figured out which specialty they're in, hmm. they want to be in or where they want to move their training to. Let's say they're a resident looking for a fellowship or a medical student looking for a specific specialty. Give me some thoughts on your idea of what we've worked on and how that plays into looking for somebody and a training program. I think a lot of it to a degree is taking yourself out of it as the mentor in the sense that of course, it's flattering for your mentee to go into the thing that you want to do or say, you know, I really value what you do and I want to do the same thing. But I think part of being a good mentor is being open to the fact that they're their own person and it's equally successful if they want to go into cardiology and do those things. And I think that is reflective of the tribalism things is because where we saw people get along better across specialties and cultures or people that were more aware of those differences and open to them. I think it's kind of the same with the mentor mentee thing. I mean, that's one thing that I valued at, you know, Northwestern uh, is that even though that I went somewhere else, it's not like you all disowned me or something like that. You, you said, Hey, wh wherever is best for you and we're happy to, to help you get there and everything else. I think that's the, the type of mentor that you want because they're kind of mm -hmm. taking themselves out of it to a degree. Well, actually you're not telling the truth, Eric. You left because you're an emotional poikilotherm. <laughs> that I, your mental your mental health is rele directly related to the ambient temperature. So you're a perfect Californian. It's true. Well, I'd only be a perfect Californian if uh, <laughs> I complained a lot more about things. You know, you know fell off horse <laughs> onto Tesla, get anger what? angry when there's a little bit of rain on the road because the world's ending. So. <laughs> I see. No, I, that's true. But I would also add to that, Eric, I think for our listeners that we have discovered, I think, and quite clearly identified, you especially have identified that the culture of the specialty is the culture of the specialty. And that's what determines your attraction for it or your drive to go into it and why another specialty might not be for you. Yep. So those are the kind of things you got to look at. So at a level below selecting a mentor, if you're thinking about a specialty or some aspect of a particular specialty that you're interested in, look at the culture. What are they like? I mean, do you match? And it's not about going out for beers, although it might be. It's really about, do they share common values? Do they share common interests? Are these the kind of people who I could spend a lot of time with? Yep. And there are those groups. You just have to find them. Probably same with practices too, on the back end of that, like, you know, you've chosen interventional radiology. Now you're trying to decide what's, what's the right practice for me, where I'm going to be happy is trying to figure out, well, what, what is that unique group of people where, where, where am I going to jam and be happy and successful? 
Well, let me ask you this. You're thinking about a career where you want to go academics versus private practice. Who are you going to look to for assistance in that regard? How are you going to find your, your mentor for that? Because I ain't it, right? I mean, I just did this one thing. I mean, what do I, I can't tell you anything, but somebody else can. I've been crowd surfing a bit uh, or crowd sourcing a bit. How's that? Crowd surfing too, but. <laughs> oh yeah. Have you talked to anybody specifically who's acted as a guidance counselor or some uh, somebody with some wisdom on this a issue? Not really. It's really been a lot of personal experiences. So like I was recently at Western Angio, which has, you know, a higher density of private practice folks and whatnot. So then they had a lot of social events and things. I got to have drinks with a bunch of random people that I never met before in our profession and just ask them what they do and why they chose their practice and what makes them happy. And then, you know, really part of that exercise is me saying like, is this me? Like, is, is this the sort of thing that I'm seeing in myself or not? But it would be nice, yeah, to have some sort of person that has it more all figured out to serve as a guide rather than me just, you know, random sampling different places. <laughs> Well, I would only advise that you ask for help. You know, the most powerful uh, words in the English language or any language are, can you help me? And there's a universal, in my experience, response to that that's sim sympathetic and will often get you a long way towards your goal. Can you help me? So that that's really what it's about. The mentor-mentee relationship is about somebody looking for some guidance, looking for help, asking for that and then embarking on a process of of working together to figure out what that person needs and wants it's not an assignment it's not an assignment and it's not a, a project it's about guiding somebody as they are figuring things out it's very rewarding and hopefully rewarding bilaterally i don't think we could have concluded any better way than that oh yeah well you know i could bullshit with the with the best of america you know that appreciate you you taking the time to to come on the show with me and then, you know, beyond this, of course, be an excellent mentor to me throughout the, this time. Hopefully it's helpful to the, the listeners of this, this show, kind of our exploration of the, the meta discourse of mentorship and what it might mean in a more practical and distilled way. Absolutely. And I think it can be done. So it's uh, been fun talking to you, Eric. Fun talking to you too. I'll see you around. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.